Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Conway Hall in quarantine. Um, I hope you're all doing well out there. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so, welcome to Thinking on Sunday. If you've not attended a Thinking on Sunday either online or at, at Conway Hall in the dim and distant past, we, uh, these, these talks are founded many, many years ago at South Bay Ethical Society as an alternative to uh, church ceremonies um, where people, where a philosopher or scientist or someone would come along and give a talk that would provoke thought. Um, and these have continued for a good couple of centuries now. Um, we've been continuing this as and when we can during lockdown. Um, and before I introduce our speaker, just to say that Conway Hall mainly depends on events income for to run, we really get no additional funding. So if you haven't already, we would really appreciate it if you could donate some money to our crowd funder or to Conway Hall just to help us keep going through this difficult time because we, among many other venues, are having a hard time. Um, I hope everyone can hear me out there. Uh, so thinking on Sunday, it's it's part of the ethos of Conway Hall and why we exist. We uh, we we bring on a speaker who has something interesting to say that will hopefully maybe change your worldview and how you see yourselves or how you see the world. Um, and uh, they they give a, they give a talk about forty five minutes and then we have a, a Q and A session. If a, if a question does come to you, uh, do please. Um, into the Q&A uh, section of, of Zoom. Uh, we can go through them and let us know if you're willing for us to open up your microphone so you can ask questions directly of uh, Matthew Cobb. Um, hopefully Matthew is behind his name there and we'll um, turn on his camera in a moment. Hello Matthew. Um, so uh, speaking uh, on the subject of um, the history of the idea of the brain. We're spending a lot of, we've all been spending a lot of time in our brains at the moment, so uh, I think this is uh, it's good. To Entirely understand. pleasant sometimes. <laughs> it's good to get an idea of uh, where we've been. Uh, Matthew Cobb is a professor of zoology at the University of Manchester. He is an author of a number of books, and his latest one, uh, "The Idea of the Idea of the Brain," is available now. We'll have a slide at the very end of his talk, letting you know about uh, where an, uh, an ethical place where you can get it from. He is the award-winning translator of books on the history of molecular biology, on Darwin's idea, and um, nature of life. So, be please welcome to uh, Thinking on Sunday, Professor Matthew Cobb on brains. Thank you very much, and uh, lovely to see so many people from all over the world tuning in. Uh, Sorry we can't all be with each other, but this is better than nothing. Right, I'm going to share my screen and uh, then we'll start the talk. Whoops, this should all go well. Okay, so this is the title of my book and the subject of my talk. And what I'm going to do is to explain how our ideas of the brain have changed over time. So it's going to be partly historical, but at the end, I'm going to bring you right up to the present day and even take you into the future. So I think the first thing to realize is that our interest in the brain is in fact relatively modern and that for most of human history, most people have believed that thinking is done with the heart. And it only takes a moment's introspection, which we're all doing an awful lot of under lockdown, to realize why this is because you know you don't feel like you're in your head well you might i certainly don't i'm i'm connected my all my feelings are connected with my body my heart races when i'm excited my stomach churns when i'm feeling nervous and so on and this localization of emotions and thoughts in the viscera not in the head but in the body and the organs of the body is something that we can see in every culture every culture that has been studied you find the localization has not been in the head but has been another part of the body and for much of the west in particular it's been the heart and we can see this in english we can see this in a whole series of phrases that are in fact a kind of linguistic fossil of this old idea of what was going on here we go just some of them yeah i'm sure you can think of others and if you try replacing the word heart in those sentences and putting in brain 
it just sounds silly it does it just doesn't work so we've still got in our language in our ideas and our ways of thinking we've still got the legacy of this old idea about where uh, mind actually was located now to understand how people have actually thought about this and the change in the ideas we have to go back to some of the earliest written records of course people's before writing had similar ideas would be uh, our very strong idea and uh, that's been supported by lots of anthropological studies from the uh, 18th and 19th century when people went and discussed uh, with uh, indigenous peoples and recorded their evidence the earliest written evidence we've got of course comes from the ancient greece Greeks and in particular Aristotle very much the father of Greek uh, Greek philosophy he argued that in the fourth century BC uh, what everybody kind of generally thinks that the heart is the center of thought so Aristotle isn't coming up with a new idea he's codifying and justifying an idea that was widely held and the brain he argued was simply there to cool the blood it was kind of a big radiator didn't seem to have any other function However, very shortly afterwards, a series of thinkers such as Herophilus, Erasistratus and Hippocrates all argued that the mind is in the brain. However, they didn't have any evidence to support their position. So between them and Aristotle, there really wasn't much to choose. The first bit of evidence we have about where the mind is comes from the work of an ancient Roman, Galen now uh, generally known as the founder of what passed for medicine in the West for about 1500 years, Galen was in fact a remarkable thinker. He was not only a physician and a surgeon, he was a philosopher and a poet, wrote millions of works, uh, millions of words, uh, and much of his work was lost in a, in a fire, but he was an, a, an extremely influential thinker in the early years of the common era. And around about you know, at the end of the, the second century of the common era, he showed in a rather gruesome experiment that you could stop the heart of an animal and it would remain awake. However, if you pressed on its brain, it would go unconscious. So Galen was able, Galen was convinced that the mind was in the, in the brain and he was able by this experiment, which is extremely well known and was reproduced uh, in medieval manuscripts and so on, uh, he was able to demonstrate the ro relative roles of the heart and the brain and the, the brain simply seemed to be much more important than the heart. You could stop the heart and it didn't have any effect. However, because of the weight of Aristotle's overwhelming philosophical theories and their influence in the West and in the Arab world, most people, most thinkers in for the next kind of 1500 years felt that Aristotle was right. And part of the reason for that, of course, was this intimate experience that we all have of the role of our viscera in our emotions and in our feelings and so on. Now, we can see when this idea begin to, began to change in Shakespeare. So this is from The Merchant of Venice, which is written at the end of the 16th century. And he says, at the very, this is one of the songs that you always skip over when you're studying it at school. Tell me where is fancy bread, or in the heart or in the head. So fancy was ideas. So Shakespeare knows, and he's putting this into his songs and therefore he knows that his audience knows, that there's an argument about this, that people aren't sure that they're having this dispute. And whilst all those clever clogs might think it's in the head, the everyday experience suggests that it's in the heart. Now, over the 17th century, anatomical evidence suggested very strongly two things. Firstly, that the heart was simply a pump, as somebody put it in about 1670. This was discovered uh, by Harvey uh, in about 1620. The heart simply seems to be moving blood around the body. On the other hand, the brain and investigations in the latter years of latter decades of the 16th, 17th century demonstrated this. The brain was unbelievably complicated. And eventually, by the 18th century, this chap 
uh, Joseph Priestley, a remarkable thinker, a chemist who one of the things he did was to discover oxygen. He, for him, it was absolutely self-evident. You, you, you've got to imagine this being read in a voice. He was from Yorkshire. So you've got to imagine this being in a read in a, a voice somewhere between Alan Bennett and Jeff Boycott. I won't try. Uh, in my opinion, there's just the same reason to conclude that the brain thinks as that it is white and soft. In other words, it was self-evident. There is no instance of any man retaining the faculty of thinking when his brain was destroyed. And whenever that faculty is impeded or injured, there is sufficient reason to believe that the brain is disordered in proportion. So by 1775, for a thinker in the West, this was absolutely self-evident. But what's striking in looking at the previous millennia is that despite Galen's experimental evidence, there was no brain-centric moment. There wasn't a single decisive experiment. There wasn't a moment when the apple fell from the tree and everything became clear. Instead, what we have, in particular from the 15th to the 18th centuries, is this slow accumulation of certainty that the brain is where ideas come from. That's where the mind is, and the rest of the body seems to be carrying out some crude kind of physiological function. Now, as soon as people began to become convinced that it was in the brain, then they began to think about, well, what might it be like? What might, how might the brain work? And the first person to really think of this was the philosopher, French philosopher Descartes, who in the 1630s in Paris saw these various statues, hydraulic statues, that would move by very simple uh, hydraulic mechanisms. It's kind of primitive animatronics. And for example, you'd have this chap here who would bash the dragon on the head and all that was moved, uh, produced by water, going up and down, changing weights and so on. You had statues would come out of the shrubbery and kind of scare people, or there was another one where somebody would play a flute and so on. So Descartes looking at these uh, moving statues thought, well, Maybe that's how the brain works. Maybe it's a hydraulic system. It, we, he knew that there were nerves that connected the, the peripheral organs, uh, peripheral sense organs and the central sense organs with the brain. And in this little image, he imagined that when, for example, this big kind of baby thing burnt its foot, then the, something would go up here, something like the hydraulic power in uh, the dragon and the, the, the hunter would go up here into the brain and then would come back down and you'd move your foot. This is obviously an early uh, example of the reflex, although that word wasn't used at the time. Now, unfortunately for Descartes, uh, this was completely wrong. It was very easy to prove it was wrong. Shortly after uh, his uh, book, explaining his ideas was published after his death, uh, people immediately went away and got, uh, you know, killed animals and immediately cut their nerves and no hydraulic fluid came spurting out under pressure. There is nothing like that in our nerves. So it was clear that uh, Descartes' hydraulic model was wrong. But what's striking about this is quite how clever Descartes was, because these kind of moving statues had been around since antiquity. They were around in ancient Greece. There were all sorts of things in, in um, temples and so on and uh, in royal palaces that worked along uh, due to hydraulic power or wind power, you had moving statues. And yet Descartes was the first person to think there might be a insight to be gained from technology, from looking at technology that could tell you something about the brain. And that's really the theme uh, of what I'm about to tell you of the next 400 years, 350, 400 years of uh, investigation. Now, it wasn't only hydraulic power that people had at this time. There were obviously clocks, which had been invented in, around about the 14th, 15th century. And our mastery of clockwork achieved its absolute height with this exquisite automaton uh, made by Pierre Jacques de Rose. Uh, you can still see this when lockdown finishes, you can go to Switzerland and actually see this working uh, in a, a museum. And the, the video might be a bit laggy, uh, but with a bit of luck, it'll work. Okay, you can see, should be able to see the writer moving and his pen is writing letters. Now you could change the letters uh, there's kind of, it was programmable. You could make the, the automaton write different scripts. And you should be able to see his eyes moving creepily. Maybe not. 
anyway uh you can find this on you can find this on youtube uh so th nobody actually thought that the this automaton or other similar things uh, like a silver swan you can see in uh, barnard castle maybe that's what uh, dominic cummings was going to see similar uh, automaton nobody actually thought these things were alive but they were clearly showing some similarities to human behavior and people began to imagine that maybe there was some insight that could be gained from these kind of systems. Now, the big breakthrough came with the discovery of electricity in the middle of the 18th century, uh, which was shown initially uh, that it could produce movement in frogs. And this was in uh, early primitive batteries, which stored a single charge and would suddenly release it like a single electric shock. The great breakthrough came at the beginning of the 19th century when Volta developed what would we call a battery, uh, a pile, which is composed of a series of layers of uh, different metals covered in acid, and that released a continuous current. And that basically opened the road in the 19th century for all sorts of experiments using electricity. And in particular, uh, this done by Aldini in 1804, where uh, this was done in, I mean, it was kind of in semi-public. This was to a, a group of learned uh, thinkers and uh, physicians who saw in uh, 1804 a dead man who'd recently been you know, hours before, an hour before, had been hanged for killing his wife and child. Uh, the dead body was brought in, and to the horror of the, the the guests, the observers, when you put two electrodes on either side of the dead man's head, then his eyes would open, they would roll about in their orbits, his teeth would grind, his arms would move up and down and so on. So it seemed, it seemed as though electricity was actually the stuff of life, was able to bring bodies back to life. And it's very probable that uh, seeing such a demonstration at the Royal Institution, not on a dead human body, but on a dead animal, may have inspired Ma a young Mary Godwin uh, to a few years later, when she was known as Mary Shelley, to write a book known as Frankenstein. Now, in the 1830s, we began to get telegraph uh, systems covering whole countries. And telegraph became available in about 1836. And here we've got from 1846 a map of the telegraph system covering the whole of the UK. And similar systems were all over Europe, all over America, so covering whole continents. And people very quickly drew a parallel between the telegraph system and the nervous system of the human body with uh, obviously London is at the center uh, of, the, of the United Kingdom. It's the, the heart and the brain, or certainly the brain in this case, and the nerves all go down in much the same way as the brain uh, has all these nerves connected to it. And this is, wasn't just some kind of flight of fancy. It meant that people started to think about messages going down the nerves much as messages went down the telegraph wires. Uh, and we can see quite how seriously some thinkers took this idea from this chap. You've probably never heard of him. He's the most remarkable person I came across in doing the research for this book, Alfred Smee. He worked for the Bank of England uh, and he was an inventor and a bit of a crank, but very insightful as well. And in 1848, he began writing a series of popular books about his theory, which was his, uh, called uh, Electrobiology. And he was convinced of the significance of the metaphor, the analogy between the telegraph system and uh, the nervous system. And he said, we really have electrotelegraphic communication in the nervous system. That which is seen or felt or heard is telegraphed to the brain. Now, he actually wrote, drew up little schemes, little models, which he thought uh, would be able to explain this. And we can see here, the, this one here is for nervous system of what he called lower animals. So you've got the muscles the, and the sensory organs, you've got the nerves going up into the brain. And you can see this is, I mean, it looks like it's kind of means something, but it's very hard to actually see what it might mean. But he claimed that this showed how the idea of a nest may be implanted in the bird or of a honeycomb in the wasp or bee. Well, can't quite see it myself. Uh, happily, uh, <coughs> 
the uh, the system in humans is much more complicated, but not really, just because we've got a few more hierarchical levels. So whatever the limits of Smee's insights, and I think they're quite substantial, and he had very little influence on uh, subsequent events, uh, as can be seen by the fact that I'd never heard of him until I started doing the research. Uh, nonetheless, this shows you how people were trying to think about electricity and the brain and how it might work. And they're using metaphors from technology to explain the brain. Now, what's striking in Smee's presentation, and one of the reasons why it's hard to understand, is that there was no localization of function. Back in these figures, it seems to, order just seems to emerge. The idea of a nest or of honeycomb, it's very hard to see how that's represented. It's, it, it, it's seeming to emerge from that, that network. But at this time, from the early decades of the 19th century, everybody became convinced that there was localization of function in the brain and different bits of the brain did different things. So for example, this was a science or pseudoscience more accurately known as phrenology. And this uh, really took off in the early years of the 19th century and dominated the whole of Western culture, or certainly popular culture. Uh, if you are an adept of the Sherlock Holmes stories, you'll no doubt know that when Holmes and his arch enemy Moriarty first meet, uh, Moriarty makes a very disparaging comment about Holmes on the base of his basis of the shape of his skull, because according to phrenology, what you can feel on the outside of the, the skull reflects the shape of the brain and thereby the personality. Um, so, I mean, that's absolute rubbish for two reasons. First, you know, your skull is very thick and the lumps and bumps on your head do not correspond to the shape of your brain. Secondly, there's no evidence for, you know, there being a single organ of acquisitiveness just here above your ear. So this rapidly became something very similar, I guess, to astrology today. That is, people you know, may have been interested in it. They, they didn't necessarily believe it, but it was part of the generally accepted knowledge that there was localization of function. Different bits of the brain uh, did different things. Now, whilst this figure is frankly rubbish, it did soon become obvious that there was some kind of link between structure, location and function. And in, this came about in particular through the work of David Ferrier. And David Ferrier, uh, using very fine electrodes and very gentle batteries, batteries that were invented by Smee as it happens, uh, was able to stimulate the various areas of a, a monkey's brain and show that they control movement or some areas seem to control hearing because when you stimulated them, the animal's ears would prick and it would look round as though it had heard something. And he was able to draw parallels between the structures or the areas that were sensitive on a monkey's brain from that of a human. And he did not do this by doing experiments on humans, I hasten to add. He did it by looking at structural similarities. So you can see that 14 got three areas called 14 here they're similar down here in the human but also evidence from strokes so people who had a stroke after they died post-mortem examination would reveal that they had a particular lesion in a particular part of the body and indeed what had actually driven this whole area of localization of function research was a study by a French researcher called Broca, who discovered in the uh, early 1660s, 1860s, sorry, that this area, now known as Broca's area, the front left-hand side of your brain, the one I'm using now, controls speech. And this was disturbing to Brockett for two reasons. Firstly, the French were very hostile to phrenology, or certainly the French academics were, uh, because Descartes had argued that thought was indivisible and therefore brain was indivisible. And therefore for purely philosophical reasons, there must be no localization of function. And Brocker not only discovered localization of function, he discovered it on only one side. So the other side of the brain, the right frontal area of the brain is not involved in speech production. So by the 1870s, everybody began to become convinced that although phrenology was nonsense, there was some localization of function uh, in the brain. 
Uh, but what exactly did that mean? How was the brain doing this? What was actually happening? And around about the same time, two thinkers came up with two very striking models, visions of what the brain is doing that still dominate how we think about it today. First is this chap here, von Helmholtz, who is a German uh, physiologist, and he showed by his studies of the visual system that the brain makes what he calls inductive conclusions about the world. And you can see this uh, if you have both your eyes working uh, and you open one eye and then shut and switch from one eye to the other, you can see that the images change slightly. But your brain takes each of those 2D images and with, before you are even aware of what you're looking at, it is making conclusions about how the world looks in three dimensions and the fact that you can see things in depth, that some objects are in front of others and so on. So rather than vision being or perception being just peering out of a window in a kind of numbskulls inside out version uh, of what the brain and the mind are like, in fact, the brain is making inductive conclusions. Perception is not simply a one-to-one -one transfer of stimuli in the outside world to how we see things. We're actually, the brain is working stuff out all the time without us being aware of it. The other thing it's doing, which Lloyd Morgan, who was an early psychologist at the end of the 19th century, what it argues is, he argued it was doing, is controlling. And this built on a lot of insights throughout the 19th century uh, that showed that nerves not only activate, they don't only make things happen, they also stop things happen, they inhibit. And the idea of inhi inhibition in both physiology and psychology began to become extremely important. And Morgan was one of the first to use this idea of control, that the brain is controlling things. So this is a very new way. We've got this active brain, but it's not simply a passive uh, receptor. Now, around about the same time in the 1880s, more technology developed in the shape of the telephone exchange. And younger viewers will have absolutely no idea about what this represents. So I'll just explain it. So in the old days, long before we had automated telephone exchanges, to dial up a number, you spoke to somebody who's normally a woman, uh, an operator, and you, a light would come on in the local exchange. So you'd have a local an exchange in your small town, a light would come on and she would then connect a cable so she could speak to you. You would say, I want a number and she would connect the other end of that cable to the number you wanted to speak to, which would light up on here. So she was making a flexible connection. If you wanted to speak to another city, then she'd send you uh, up the line. There's a, a, one of these lights, uh, one of these slots would correspond to another operator. You have to do the same process to get through to somebody in another city. So the key idea here is that the, uh, the nervous system is flexible, that the, 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 uh, the, the telephone exchange is flexible and thinkers, philosophers, then scientists began to suggest that the brain worked like a kind of um, a kind of uh, telephone exchange. And this metaphor is still sometimes used in scientific articles. I, I saw an article in a leading neuroscience journal only a couple of years ago that talked about the brain as being like a big telephone exchange, which is rather odd. Uh, but anyway, you get the idea that there's this flexibility. Now, one person took this idea, but didn't quite get it. And that's this chap here, Arthur Keith. Arthur Keith, who also, it must be said, was a massive, massive racist and eugenicist. Uh, in, 16th, in 1916, he gave the Royal Institution Christmas lectures. Uh, and he, uh, his topic was in the five talks that he gave, which are for children, if you don't know, this is an annual uh, event that takes place. And they're, hey, these are science talks aimed at children, was the, the machinery of the body. And each chapter looked at a different organ and showed the parallels that there were between the organ and machinery. And he suggested that the brain was a telephone exchange. And he actually put in these figures. So here we've got a very crude telephone exchange with the, uh, the transmitter. This is where you speak into it. And it goes around. This is where somebody's listening. And he says, look, this is just like uh, this very simple reflex where for example, you scratch, you've got an itch here and it goes up and round, and then you can start scratching it by activating this muscle. Or you've got a very simple uh, knee jerk reflex. But what's striking, in fact, is that Keith didn't really understand the metaphor. There's no, there's no flexibility in here. This is this telephone exchange. This wire here is fixed. You can't suddenly and indeed in the in the nervous system, 
your reflexes that go through your spine uh, can't suddenly be rewired. You can't start uh, have an itch and then start showing a, a nervous uh, a knee jerk. It doesn't work that way. Or you bang your bang your knee tendon and you suddenly start scratching. So although people were using this idea in the case of Keith, he got it rather wrong. Now, new technology began to give people even more interesting ways of thinking about it. And here we've got in 1912, Salino the electric dog. So photoelectric cells had been uh, developed in the 19th century. Indeed, Smee had thought we might have an artificial eye uh, wired up to the brain using that. Um, but these people made an electric dog. They were really interested uh, in making guided missile, guided um, torpedoes. So they had a very clear military uh, idea in the run up to the First World War. And you can see here there are two eyes, two photoelectric cells. There's a bit of uh, metal dividing them. So basically Salino was a, a box with three wheels and if you shone the light on this photoelectric cell it would turn towards the left. If you shine the long light on the other photoelectric cell it would turn to the right. So it's very very crude but it was able to produce something that looked like purposive behavior. And this idea of using machines that you that you know are not conscious, well, let's hope so, uh, you can assume are not conscious, to try and see about something purposive began to interest people. Uh, and in particular, this man, uh, Lotka, who was, uh, he's generally known these days as a, a theoretical ecologist. Uh, some of you may have studied Lotka and Volterra equations uh, about ecology, but he was also interested in animal behavior. And in 1925, he was particularly taken by one of these, which is a uh, little mechanical, uh, little mechanical ladybird, and I was able to find one uh, on the internet and to wind it up and to show you. I'm going to show you a little video. You can see why he liked it so much. So we've got a uh, two chairs here. This is my hand. Here's your a little ladybird. I'm going to put it down, and so it's just clockwork. There's nothing else in it. It's just a clockwork motor. You watch what happens. See? It avoids the edge. Every time it goes to the edge, it turns round. And it will carry on doing this. It does it if it's on a, a much larger, um, if it's on a much larger uh, table as well. Now, it looks like the beetle knows where the edge is and is trying to avoid falling off. But we know that can't be the case because it's just clockwork. There's nothing else going on there. So how do you get purposive behavior from just something clockwork? And this is what intrigued Volta, uh, Volterra, um, Lotka, sorry. And here we are, we can see his little diagram of it. This is uh, the wheels here. And you've got the, the driving wheels are here and the antennae at the front normally mean that the driving wheels make it go straight forward. Yeah. But if the antennae fall off the edge, then this wheel here, and this is a, a wheel pointing sideways that uh, is normally not in contact with the ground. If the, wheel, the antennae fall down, then this wheel here comes into contact with the ground and now starts to turn the beetle away, as you could see. Now, Volt Lotka not only was interested in the, uh, the fact that it looked like it was purposive behavior, but he said, well, what's actually going on here? And what he described this as is remarkable. He's saying that this little system, which is just a clockwork uh, wheel and two bits of metal, that this construes the information from the antennae at the front. So the whole system works to produce apparently purposive behavior, but each of the component parts of it, I mean, there's only one motorized part, the rest is just arrangements of bits of metal. So Locker is saying that something really quite important can, can emerge out of a very simple organization of different components. And in the, as, as uh, Lotka was arguing this, this chap here, uh, Adrian, who is probably the most important biologist of the 20th century you've never heard of. Um, and he was absolutely, absolutely remarkable. He won the Nobel Prize in his, early, in his late 30s. Two of his students won a Nobel Prize. He went on to become vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge, an astonishing man. But as well as his actual research, he also wrote books for the general public. He was very, very concerned 
that the general public understand what he was doing. And he was primarily interested in how nerves respond to stimuli. And here we've got, for example, a, uh, a nerve with different weights attached to, to it. And the heavier the weight, the more of these little, what are called spikes, uh, the nerve produces. And to explain what was going on to the general public, he started to use words like code and information, just as uh, Lotka had done and messages, that idea that went back to the 19th century. But above all, he's thinking on the idea of a code. There's a neural code, he argued, and we can try and understand it. And this is the beginning of all these ways of thinking about nervous system function that are now absolutely obvious to, to us all. They come from Adrian and his popular science books from the early 1930s onwards. Adrian could also do something quite remarkable. He was able to show, uh, well, phrenology was wrong because it's not that you can't feel the lumps uh, on your head, or you can feel the lumps on your head, but you can't feel what your brain is. Uh, but at the time, it was discovered in the early 1930s that you could actually record from the brain from the outside by just putting an electrode on the outside of the skull. And he would do this in conferences. He'd wire and put these electrodes onto his head and then shut his eyes. And he would get this lovely out, what's called an alpha wave, this very, very smooth way. This is, you still, this is what happens when you're relaxed, when you're very, you're in the zone. If you're doing yoga at the moment to get through the stress of, of lockdown, then this is what happens when you get it right. On the other hand, uh, this is him. You can see it's why it says EDA. These are his initials. If he opened his eyes, that disappeared. The alpha wave went away. If he shut them again, it came back instantly. Interestingly, if he kept his eyes shut, but he was asked to do some mathematics, like, I don't know, work out the square root of 63 or something, um, he would then, the alpha, the alpha wave would equally disappear. So it was what his brain was doing uh, could be, was reflected in the uh, shapes uh, that they could record. Now, amazingly, uh, Adrian also did this with a beetle, not a clockwork beetle, but a very large water beetle. And he put an electrode, little electrode onto its head and he saw what it was thinking. And it did exactly the same thing. Here we've got it in the dark, the beetle's chilling away, it's got its alpha waves. You turn the light off, they go. You turn the light back on, uh, back off rather, and uh, they, they come back. Uh, he didn't say what he did, what happened if he tried to ask it to, to do some complicated maths. Probably nothing, I guess. So w we can see these ideas of the brain working on the basis of electricity and it's reflecting various functions uh, of what's going on, what you're being asked to do or the stimuli that are coming into it or the thought processes that are going on. And this idea in particular, if you think about what it means about that, the fact that the maths could get rid of the alpha waves, this idea was developed by uh, this person here called Kenneth Craik uh, from Cambridge, who died sadly in 1944. He was knocked, over a, uh, knocked off his bike. Um, and he argued that the fundamental of feature of neural machinery is its power to parallel or model external events. In other words, the brain represents in various ways what is happening in the outside world. And it can manipulate those ideas, even if those ideas are things like numbers, as in the ca case of Adrian's changed activity. And this idea of computation being significant in the brain uh, was developed through the work of these two people, McCulloch and Pitts. Pitts was one of the most extraordinary men of the uh, scientists of the, uh, of the 20th century, entirely self-taught. Um, he uh, ended up working in McCulloch's lab when he was about 17, brilliant mathematician, uh, very, very strange man indeed. But in 1943, McCulloch and Pitts published an article in which they which they called the imminent logic of the nervous system. And their claim was that the way that nervous systems are wired up enables them to carry out very simple computations. And I'll show you some examples. So we've got in a normal nervous system, you've got two neurons, one and two, and this is, neuron is received a stimulation and it sends the message on to the next one uh, down the line. And it does this through these structures here, which are called synapses. Now, here, we've simply got a straightforward transmission. But we could imagine that 
a neuron would be wired up such that it needed two stimuli from two separate neurons, this one here and this one here. And you could imagine that in logic, you could describe that connection as an AND gate. We could have a system where you could have either of those two neurons, this one or this one firing, and then number three would respond. And that could be an OR gate. Or we could imagine a system in which the neuron wanted neuron one to fire, but not neuron two. And that would be a NOT gate. And any of the, you who've done any computer program, programming will immediately recognize these conceptions, these ideas. And the reason for that is that they were used to create the computing systems we know today. This was all part of the development of uh, theoretical logic from the 1930s onwards, uh, obviously with Alan Turing, but McCulloch and Pitts said that there's something in the brain that enables this to take place and it's in its very structure. And this idea was taken so seriously that in fact, in all the devices we've got, in my phone, in what you're watching this on, this logic is embedded because von Neumann, the John von Neumann, the, the, the man who actually designed the digital computer, not the analog computer uh, that uh, Turing and others were working on, but the digital computer, the one we all use today, he used McCulloch and Pitt's paper from 1943 as a justification for the kind of machine he wanted to build. So although we now say the brain was li is like a computer, in fact, at its beginning, the brain, the computer was a brain. Von Neumann explicitly says to the American government, who's funding his uh, project, I will build you a computer and it will be based on the human brain. Now, von Neumann soon realized what any electrophysiologist could have to told McCulloch and Pitts, uh, nervous systems are not wired up like that. That's a very simplistic way of seeing them, but it had tremendous influence and we are still living in this epoch of the computer brain metaphor. The computer carries out computations and so on. Um, I can show you a very, uh, a little video showing you how these ideas were embodied in a robot uh, through this chap here, Gray Walter, and his tortoise, it's not really a tortoise, uh, called Toby. And you'll hear the man from Pathé News explaining it. The video again might be a bit laggy, but you should get the idea. Now meet Dr. Gray Walter of Bristol. Why the torch? Well, here's the reason. It's Toby, a mechanical tortoise with an electronic brain which functions like the human mind. No, it doesn't function like the human mind, but never mind. Toby's head, or rather magic eye, is a photoelectric cell constantly revolving until it picks up the strongest source of light, to which it is then attracted. In this case, an ordinary electric torch guides the mechanical tortoise in any direction its inventor chooses. It can also negotiate obstacles. When it hits an object, the pressure on the shell causes a short circuit of the photoelectric cell mechanism and the tortoise moves at random until it is free of the obstacle. Okay, so the key point here is that by programming, by creating the hardware, you are able to produce something that produces, again, purposive behavior, but on a level of sophistication that is far greater even than Salino the electric dog. Salino only had, had two single uh, receptors and could only either turn right or left. Toby is able to uh, detect where the light's coming from, move accordingly, and so on. All this work led to our, the model of we currently have of what we think a brain does. And that is the brain contains symbolic representations of the outside world, that it manipulates through computations that enable it to predict what will happen and to produce appropriate behaviors. And among the various processes that are involved, we could say there's feedback, inhibition, and calculations of probability, how likely it is that certain things could happen. But even if we think that's what a brain does, that doesn't actually solve the problem. How exactly are these processes represented in the brain? And that's where it starts to get uh, a bit tricky. The starting point is that, as you may have noticed when I showed you this figure from uh, Adrian earlier on, neurons are not digital. Although whether or not they show a single spike, that is either an all or none event, there is a spike or there isn't, 
what neurons actually do, how they represent that outside world is, as this representation of increasing weight shows, it's analog. You've only got one spike for 50 grams, but you've got far, four in a very short amount of time for 500 grams. The response grows stronger with increasing weight. So uh, the way that neurons are actually, what they're actually telling the brain is not digital. They are completely different from the very beginning, completely different to a computer or completely different to any computer that we have built. Furthermore, these neurons, the activity of these neurons is altered by the body in which they are living, by the hormones that are surging around, by the activity of other neurons and other classes of cell as well. Just to give you some idea of what's going on, so those synapses, these connections between two nerves, when the message, the electron electrochemical message comes down the nerve, it has to turn into a chemical signal that passes across uh, from the synapse from this cell to this cell. And these are the things, these neurotransmitters are the substances that are often uh, targeted by drugs that are prescribed to uh, ameliorate mental health problems. But just to give you some idea of what's going on, there are in any one synapse, there can be dozens of neurotransmitters, dozens. These neurotransmitters can activate and inhibit the cell opposite. So it's completely different from a digital uh, synapse. The human synapse has about five and a half thousand different proteins in it. So the complexity of them is far, far greater than we currently really understand. And as I said, those hormonal effects are going to alter either the way in which these, these neurotransmitters are transmitted, or even act as kind of mini long-term neurotransmitters that for hours or even days can alter the activity of these synapses. Just to give you some idea of quite how complicated a synapse can be, I'm gonna talk at one slide about my animal, which is the maggot. And here we've got a Drosophila maggot. This is a tiny thing, a couple of millimeters long, and it's wriggling along. And to do that wriggling, a maggot body needs to know that it has stretched because as you can see, it's doing a sequence of behave, repetitive behaviors. And people have been very interested in trying to understand all the components of this. So you've got to have something that can detect a stretch, tell not the brain, but the nervous system, oh, I've stretched, you need to now move the muscles so we can do this in this little cycle. And uh, this is what it looks like, the stretch receptor here. It's in the muscle wall. This is the body of the, uh, of the maggot. It's got muscles here. Uh, this is the head right at the very front end. And this is the brain. And this isn't even the brain. This is the ventral nervous system, nervous cord. So this is its equivalent of its spine, but it's uh, in, its, in its belly. And this cell here, which is saying, oh, I've stretched, is going to then tell that information to the center. Uh, there'd be like a reflex, which will then come out and alter the activity of the, the muscle. Now, each of those cells has 53 input synapses, 18 output synapses, and is connected to 74 other cells. And many of these synapses have multiple neurotransmitters. And that is just to say, oh, I've stretched. You need to stop pulling now and get ready to go through another cycle. That's all it's saying. It's not saying anything complicated. Simply, I have stretched. And that is what a maggot has. So that starts to give us some idea of the complexity of nervous systems and synapses. Uh, and uh, this was uh, tweeted by um, Sophie Scott from University College London in uh, a couple of years ago now. And she specializes in how sound is processed in uh, the human ear. Today, I spent reading about subcortical auditory processing, like this bastard here. Just one neuron away from the cochlea, so that's the bit you hear with, all hell breaks loose. Eight different cell types, all these cell types in here. This is the message coming in from the cochlea, and then bang, it, eight different cell types, five different parallel processing streams, all preserving tonotopy. That means how the sound is represented. And that's just the start. How do we ever hear anything? And this is a common response of anybody who actually gets into the nitty gritty of how even very simple messages at the periphery are processed, we end up thinking, 
goodness me, it is so complicated. And we're not even in the brain yet. This is right at the outside of your hearing system. But you may be saying, well, wait a minute. I've seen all those images on you know, the TV and the brain's lighting up. Uh, and here's, indeed, there are many such images. This is the first that was published. This is from Science Magazine, 1991. So we're coming up to the 30th anniversary soon of the fMRI breakthrough. And this is a method of detecting activity in the brain. And what it does when you're in the scanner, it tells you where there is some activity, where there is, there is blood flow. It doesn't tell you what's going on. It doesn't tell you whether something is activated or if it's inhibited. It just says there's blood flow. And above all, you need to know quite how coarse this method for studying humans is. Now, if we just look at what each voxel, that's the smallest unit of one of these scans that we see with the brain lighting up, each voxel contains 5.5 million neurons, up to 55 billion synapses, 22 kilometers of dendrites, that's the input side of the neuron, and 220 kilometers of output. So not only does this not tell us whether this area is being activated or inhibited, the level of complexity, the minimum level of complexity this can reveal is of this order. It is absolutely vast. And above all, just because you know that something is happening somewhere, that doesn't mean to say you actually understand. Uh, as a very famous pioneer neuroscientist put it, where is not how. If you want to know how the brain acts as a computer, how it processes things, fMRI, sadly, is not going to provide you with the resolution you need. Some of the greatest insight we've got has come from studies of vision. And in the late 1950s, two American researchers, Hubel and Wiesel, studied vision in the cat. Now, initially, they discovered that cells on the retina were responsive to dots. So if you shone a dot onto the uh, animal's retina, then a cell would respond. But they soon realized that whilst these cells in the brain, we've got four here, one for each of these four dots, whilst these cells in the brain could explain dots, how an, an animal might perceive a dot. In fact, there was the possibility that they were wired up, a bit like Sme argued, actually. And we've got, if we've got these four cells, this one here, this one here, and this one here, and this one here, then you end up with a receptor here, a cell here, that can detect a line. Okay, you can see how that works. And you can also see the influence of McCulloch and Pitt's idea. The problem with this is it doesn't actually explain how vision works. How, I mean, we don't see the world either composed of dots or composed of lines. And in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, neuroscientists thought about this a lot and they, they realized the problem would be if you carried on in this kind of hierarchical way and we stick all the lines together to make a face, say, you'd have to have, uh, I don't know, a face for me, um, a face for your grandmother. And your grandmother's face would have to be detected when she was standing on a head or sideways. Or you'd be able to recognize your grandmother. You'd have to have a cell that could recognize your grandmother when she was riding on a horse backwards playing a, a ukulele. Because you could still say it was your grandmother. So clearly there's a problem with this idea of hierarchization. Our brains are immense, but they're not that big. There'd need to be more neurons than there are uh, atoms in the known universe for this to work. So that's clearly wrong. Or is it? Because uh, about 12 years ago, uh, researchers discovered something very, very strange. They were preparing some patients who were going to have uh, their brains operated on because they had terrible debilitating epilepsy. And very generously, these patients allowed neuroscientists to go poking around in their brains shortly before the operation, uh, while they were conscious, to see what they could see. Um, I'm not sure I'd do that. Anyway, they are recording from an area in the brain that had been suggested by fMRI to be involved with the detection of faces. And they're recording from single cells. Now, they didn't show pictures of people's grandmother, but they did, for one person, show them a picture of Jennifer Aniston. And that cell got very, very excited when it saw Jennifer Aniston. But it didn't if it was shown this picture of Jennifer Aniston and their then husband, Brad, 
Brad Pitt. So they could show all sorts of pictures of Jennifer Aniston and the cell recognized them and got really, really excited. So there might not be a grandmother cell, but there could be perhaps a Jennifer Aniston cell. To show you it's not all rubbish about celebs, uh, somebody else had a cell that responded very, very excitedly to the image of the Sydney Opera House or the words Sydney Opera House. So it seems like it was a concept that these cells were representing. Somebody else uh, who was an engineer got one of his cells got very excited if they showed a particular differential equation. Now, this looks like there are is that degree of specificity in the activity of our neurons. But you've got to remember, this is an illusion. It's an illusion of our thinking, oh, they're recording from that cell. Therefore, that is simply the only cell that is activated. In reality, there will have been millions of cells activated when they show any of these images to these subjects. And the slow overlap of those images is what enables us to, of those neural networks is what enables us to uh, recognize lots of things. So uh, if you knew who this woman in the back it ground is, she may be somebody famous, I don't know who she is. Uh, if you knew who she was, and clearly some of your cells would also be firing at her because of her hair, because uh, she's a woman, she's a white woman and so on. There are lots of things that you might have overlapping in recognizing Jennifer Aniston and recognizing this person in the background. But we are just recording from one cell of that network. So it looks like you've got the Jennifer Aniston cell. There is no such thing, nor a Sydney Opera House concept cell. There are a whole set of cells that are overlapping that represent in a mysterious way we don't understand how we perceive things. Now you might say, wait a minute, can't computers help us? Um, because those representations from SME, any of you who do uh, computation will know that there's something quite similar to that representation that SME came up with, with the way that people like Jeffrey Hinton, who now works for Google, have done with their uh, deep mind uh, logic programs. And I'll give you an example of something extraordinary that Hinton's programs were able to do. Uh, they set up this program and they gave it about 2 million stills from YouTube to watch. And they were just randomly taken from YouTube. They weren't telling the program to do anything. It was just left to look at this stuff. Now, it actually, of course, wasn't looking at it. It was reading patterns of zeros and ones because that's what a picture ultimately looks like. And the program wasn't looking. It was looking at sequences of zeros and ones and looking for patterns. And what it eventually came up with was entirely to their amazement, a cat detector. And if you look, squint your eyes, you'll see this is the representation of what this cat detector in the, this program looked like. We've got an ear here. We've got the top of the head here, another ear, the mouth here, the eyes you can kind of vaguely see here, bottom of the face there. So maybe this can give us an insight into how visual perception can develop. Well, probably not, as Hinton himself admitted last year. Um, the interviewer said, there's a separate problem, which is we don't know entirely how these things work, right? And Hinton, very, of, uh, very honest, said, no, we really don't know how they work. So AI is not going to help us. Uh, it might get out of control. I don't, I'm not particularly worried about that. But it's certainly not going to help us understanding the brain because they've got something they don't understand as well, which are their pro programs. And just to show you that there is a cat, I'll uh, outline it. Okay, you see that? There you go. Now, to further convince you that AI is not all it may, it's cracked up to be, uh, I just want to give you this brief example from uh, Janelle Shane, uh, the author of this book, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. Um, and she used a neural net that can write articles called GPT-2. And you may have heard of this, you write a beginning sentence and it will then start churning out paragraphs on the basis of your beginning sentence because it just read the whole of the internet so it knows how things go on. But it doesn't actually understand anything. It's got no concept, it's, it can't understand anything at all. And she showed this very remarkably by trying to get it to make some love hearts. So she gave it a load of love hearts. It's already read the whole of the internet. It gets the idea, you've got to have two, cent, two word or three word slogans, you know, love me or whatever. Uh, but this is what it came up with. Fart booby. I mean, I think uh, all hail the chicken. Uh, I'd certainly buy love hearts. So I think swizzles of new mills, 
just down the road from me in Manchester uh, should start making this. Ants can stay is quite nice. So clearly you can see from this that the poor old program hasn't got the foggiest about what's going on. Now, finally, I'm going to close now just by giving you some idea of quite how complex the brain is and our problems in understanding it. So I'm briefly going to talk about the work of Eve Marder. Now, Eve Marder is a neuroscientist from uh, Brandeis University in Boston, and she has spent her whole life studying the lobster's stomach. Not its brain, but its stomach. The lobster's stomach has got about 30 neurons in it, and those neurons produce two different rhythmic activity, patterns of activity. And it does this to activate the muscles in the lobster's stomach, which grind a bit like a, a bird's gizzard, which grind up its food. And despite kind of 30 years of study, despite incredible intelligence and amazing techniques, Marder cannot predict what will happen if she alters the activity of even one of those cells or removes it. She, she's got computer models with, where she can see all the connections, all the neurotransmitters, all the hormones involved in this system. It's probably the nervous system we understand the best and yet we can't use that knowledge to predict what will happen when you alter the activity. She's been able to show that you can get the same two patterns of activity from many, many different networks, and the networks she observes, at least in the computer, do not only produce two different patterns of activity. So there's a mismatch between our theoretical understanding of something so simple as simply the activity of 30 neurons and the reality we're able to observe. Now, what do I think the future is? I don't think we should despair. I think we should be very excited. There are astonishing discoveries being made. I think the future lies in small brains, in brains that, like the lobster's stomach, we can fully understand in terms of their development, in terms of their interconnectedness, in terms of their chemistry and their electrophysiology. And those will be things like Platinaris, which is an aquatic organism, the larva of the zebrafish, which is clearly a vertebrate, so it's more closely related to us, or the two uh, organ organisms that I've spent all my career studying, Drosophila fly, or its baby Drosophila maggot. To give you some idea, the maggot has got about 10,000 neurons in its brain. You have 80 billion. A mouse has 70 million. Uh, Drosophila has got about, the fly has got about 100,000. So these are systems that are knowable in principle. We should be able to work out their wiring diagram and colleagues are currently doing this with the maggot, but we're still a few years off even having the connectome, the wiring diagram, the full wiring diagram of a maggot brain. So where are we going? What's the future? Well, what I've shown you, I hope, is that science, culture and technology are all intertwined and that science uses technology to give us metaphors for framing our discoveries and even for imagining the kind of experiments we're going to do in the future. We can see that with the, as the metaphor, as science has changed, as technology has changed, the metaphors have changed over the history that I've been describing. But we can also see that each of those metaphors has got limited. And so they were eventually abandoned, not simply when a better metaphor came along, but when the problems associated with it became too great. And I feel that we're getting to that point now with the compu computer stroke computational metaphor we've been working with since the 1950s. We're getting to a stage where we've got so much data, but we still can't interpret it. We don't have the right kind of theoretical framework. Because the framework, the metaphor, it does enable you to think things, but the framework is also a cage. It stops you thinking other things. And when you explain this to scientists, they generally get very excited because they get it immediately. And then they want to know, well, what's the next big thing? What will be the metaphor of the future? Uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that. And if I could, I'd be both very rich and I'd be saying uh, thank you in Swedish uh, in this autumn, probably for several different prizes. So we do know, however, that new technological developments will alter how we can imagine what the brain does. And although I'm not, I don't know what that is, I have built a device that can tell us, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute. We can peer forward into the future and see what they might be. So I'm going to see, let's turn it on. I'm going to just fiddle around with the knobs. Okay. Damn. Oh, well, 
never mind it doesn't seem to be working uh you're gonna have to work it out for yourselves i think thank you uh and uh, if you want to know more about this uh my book the idea of a Bra the brain in this lovely uh edition with uh beautiful end papers and lovely golden lettering uh you can buy that if you're lucky enough to have a bookshop locally that sells it to you then you can buy it online uh, or if you want to go online then you might want to consider going to hive.co.uk which gives a cut of your purchase to the local bookshop of your choice and with that i think i am going to stop sharing and then we can start having the q a please pop a question into the chat uh into q a if you want to Thank you, Matthew. That was uh, great and uh, a brilliant illustration of futurology there at the end. So yeah, if you could contact us with your questions, um, I will unmute your microphone so you can ask them live. We've got a question from um, Giles uh, Moray, Morin. Are you there, Gilles? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. How do we pronounce your name? Uh, Gilles. And is it Morin or Morin? Morin. Morin, voila. Okay. I'm such an English accent. <laughs> Sorry. Right. My question is, if a human being was able to live for thousands of years, could they remember <laughs> their childhood? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, after the experiment. Uh, well, that's quite a question. Um, well, Memory is clearly a very weird thing because uh, we have the impression that we know exactly what happened. I often have arguments with my wife about this, about something that happened, and we have completely different views about what it was, and we are both completely convinced we're right. Uh, we aren't wearing body cams all the time, I'm glad to say, so we don't know what the answer is. So the f memory is malleable and fallible and anybody you know you watch mm. any police procedural on telly or film and you know that the eyewitness is going to get it wrong or you can do all those kind of unconscious bias things which are absolutely terrifying which reveal quite how biased you are when you've briefly shown an image mm. so memory is very it's not exact and yet one of the things that really surprised me in reading the 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 the, the book was some work done in the early 50s where again uh, neuroscientists were poking around in people's brains uh, just before they carried out an operation and they discovered that by activating certain parts of the brain people wasn't quite remembered but re-experienced things very very precise things like oh I can see my mother telling my brother for putting his coat on the wrong way around uh, or they started hearing music they started hearing a popular song that they'd heard in the past and would sing along to it. And these, these findings have been replicated They're absolutely solid. So some memories, some things do seem to be recorded kind of as we go along, but it's, it, these things were never important. In none of the examples where it's been shown, were they of any significance? It wasn't, oh, I remember the birth of my first child. It was, yeah, my mum was telling my little brother off because he put his shirt on back to front. I mean, it's rubbish, absolute nonsense. So I, I really don't know what the answer to the question is. Um, I guess a, what somebody might want to say is, oh, well, uh, what's the computational uh, capacity of the storage no. capacity of the brain, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, to which the answer is we haven't the foggiest idea and even thinking about it is wrong uh, because brains aren't digital. So, you know, when you see... Uh, that figures banded around it is just garbage it is a guesstimate um, so I don't know the answer to the question uh, I don't know what the limits to human memory are but I do know that at the moment it is very very fallible and you know what you might think you remember may not have happened at all okay thank you uh, next question Anne Turner has her hand up so Anne hello Hi, it's actually George Turner. Oh, <laughs> George. Um, right, the gentleman who was showing us the, the, night, the tortoise, the, the man from Parfait News, was showing us the, the tortoise and how it would uh, follow the light. And he used the word mind rather than brain. So my question is quite simply this, how does the history of the brain relate to the history of the mind? Yeah, there's, there's not much about mind in the book, um, <laughs> partly because that has largely been the realm of uh, 
philosophers uh, because it's very hard. So philosophers for most of human history and then obviously psychologists for the last whatever 200 years. Um, and I'm a scientist and I, uh, I find philosophy very hard because it is, um, but also because I'm looking for evidence rather than internal logic. So I deliberately didn't uh, go into the history of the mind very much in my book. And, but there clearly is such a thing, right? Well, there is in my head and I can only assume that there is in yours. Now I can't prove that, but unless you're 14, just having smoked something on a hill, thinking, hey man, everybody might be robots uh, in, the, in the evening looking at the stars, it's not a very interesting thought. So we have to assume that everybody is conscious in the same way as we are. And that's a deeply human kind of assumption. And in fact, I would argue a completely different subject. I'd argue it's also partly at the root of morality because you, know, you assume if you hurt somebody that they uh, will feel similar things and they're gonna feel similar emotions. So um, in some way we don't understand and I make no claims to having any insight into this whatsoever. I don't think anybody actually does have any insight. In ways we don't understand, consciousness emerges from the activity of your neurons. And that consciousness is, we can say a number of things about it. It's soluble for a start. It's soluble in anesthetic gases, right? So everybody who goes under the surgeon's knife the medics have no idea how it works, but they know it works. They know that if they turn on certain gases for certain volumes, psh, you've gone. And then they turn them off and you come back. How does that work? No idea. And that shouldn't worry you when you have to have surgery, uh, but uh, because they do know what they're doing, they just don't know how it works, which is, I think, okay, as long as it does work, which it does. So clearly there's something about our perception and that the activity of neurons can be altered. You know, you've only got to take the most minor recreational drug, uh, have a drink of alcohol and your mind's changed. So there is an interaction between the two things, but locating the mind in the brain is something that really, ha and, and, and identifying the, the mind as something material is something that really only begins in the late 18th century with the rise of uh, various materialist uh, concepts and so on. And indeed, phrenology, for all its rubbish, said that it's, it's just the brain, man. There's nothing else but lumps in your brain, which is determining uh, your personality, the way your mind works. Are there minds in other organisms or could there be a mind in a machine? Um, I've kind of got a bit softer on this uh, as I've grown older. And I do, in a couple of places in the book, talk about the mind of the maggot, uh, not just because it's a nice bit of alliteration, but because maybe that's what's going on. And, you know, the maggot can do various computations. It can work things out. Uh, I don't think, I hope maggots aren't conscious. If they're conscious the way I am, uh, I'm going to have a hell of a karma in the future because <laughs> I've killed a lot of them. Um, but um, maybe there is, you know, that's a, a useful way of thinking about how uh, activity of different neural networks in, acts together to emer produce an emergent function. Um, maybe mind is useful. I, I'm, I'm not so hostile uh, to the use of that term in non-human animals as I once was. Clearly our close relatives, the great apes, well, not only is it very difficult to look at a gorilla without thinking, that's a bloke in a suit, you know, it is obvious there is something going on. I mean, that's just that human intuition. I can't prove that, but then I can't prove it with you. Um, my guess is that there's something like our consciousness, but less developed. They can't use language for obvious reasons. Uh, that is going on in their head in some way. And maybe, you know, lots of other animals as well, some birds. I, I don't know, I, I can't, we're getting to the level of intuition now, which is useful. Uh, but doesn't provide answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, George. We have another Turner now. Um, Hugh Turner has a question. Hello, Hugh. Oh, no. Hang on. Wrong Hugh. Hugh, can you hear us? Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can. Brilliant. Cool. Um, yeah. Thanks for a really fascinating talk. Um, and my question was that you sort of made that point near the end about how 
you know, if you knew the next all encompassing technological metaphor, you'd be, you know, a Nobel Prize winner by now. But I guess I sort of wanted to push that point a bit and ask whether there was maybe a recent invention or just a general piece of technology that you think either provides a bit of an idea of the direction of travel in the field or maybe could equip us with a mental model to challenge that prevailing computer model? Yeah, I think there, are, I can't, no, it's a short answer, um, but I can give you two kind of warning signals, two examples where we got it wrong. Um, and when I was a, an undergraduate in the 1970s, uh, there were some researchers on memory in particular who got very excited about holograms and argued that memory and the brain worked along a holographic basis. Now, most people these days, you talk about holograms, they imagine Princess Leia and some kind of 3D visual thing. That, that's not the point about hologram. What is exciting about holograms is that even on those little things you have on your, your five pound note, the image is in every bit of it, man. That's where it gets a bit heavy is that it's kind of fractal that the same information is represented at all levels so you can chop it up into lots of bits and you'd still get princess leia an image of princess leia or the queen or whatever's on the, the five pound note so faced with a lot of research that suggests it was very difficult to disrupt memory in the human brain um some researchers who are leading uh memory researchers argued that memory was was like a hologram that it was distributed in this weird way and that you could always kind of find a bit of it and reactivate it even if you had you know a big chunk of your your, your brain removed um now this was wrong and there is some kind of localization of, of, of memory although it's much more distributed than you might think so he got very these people got very excited about hologram and they ended up barking up the wrong tree similarly uh about 15 years ago when cloud computing uh, began to be sexy. Everybody went, hey man, you know, maybe the brain's really like a set of cloud, it's like cloud computing, got central unit, and then you can store things up here and retrieve them at different moments. And, and didn't really help either. And that metaphor has kind of very quickly drifted away because it didn't actually help much. So at the moment, I can't see anything, to be honest. Uh, I know people get excited about all the stuff behind Bitcoin and stuff like that, but I I think that's just froth. I mean, I think Bitcoin's a scam, but I mean, I think the the the, the blockchain or whatever it's it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can't see how that relates to uh, the activity of nervous systems, which is what I study. Uh, so at the moment, we're kind of stuck. I mean, it, it may be that there there isn't one because of the gap between the complexity of even the simplest brain and technology. But my hunch is that something is going to come along and it will enable us to get some more insight. That's not much of an answer, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Hugh. Interesting nonetheless, thanks very much. Brain is a complicated business. Um, next question, it's from, I appreciate that some, of these, some people are asking similar questions to the ones that people are asking, so I'm hoping your answers are being covered. We've got more questions than I think we have time for, but we're gonna try another two or three, if that's okay with well, you. If we don't, if, Scott, if we don't get through the questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them online and you can put them up on the website or in the chat of the, underneath the YouTube video, or however it's okay. posted, yeah? So yeah. If you, folks, if your question doesn't get answered, verbally i will answer it um written down thank you very much um we'll find a way of sharing matthew's email address that you but if you recorded it uh you're recording so the whole chat will be recorded absolutely, absolutely. i won't put a home on <laughs> oh, yes. Public yes yes um yes. okay sophie Meyer. i'm going to open your microphone next um hello hello can you hear it sophie Hello. I can't hear you, Sophie. Here we go. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Great. Uh, earlier on, you used the phrase brain centric, and I'd be interested to hear what you th where you think we are now and where we might be heading in the future on that balance between brain and body as the sites of thinking and perception. Yeah. Well, clearly the brain is the, I'm happy to say the brain is the site of thinking and perception, but as uh, some neuroscientists wrote in oh, over 20 years ago now in a very uh, important article, the brain has a body to which you might say, well, duh, uh, but there are colleagues, uh, very clever, well-funded colleagues, not like, you know, uh, who don't agree. For example, the um, 
and the, 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 the EU Brain Project, which is the biggest civilian research project that the EU or has, has been funded ever, right? It's absolutely immense, vast amounts of money devoted to uh, the computational model, a computational model of, well, initially they said it was going to be of the human brain, and a lot of people got very cross saying this is rubbish. Um, I mean, not on neuroscience, there were open letters, all sorts. There's a huge row about it, about ten, eight years ago when it was first mooted. Um, and what they've ended up doing is modeling a tiny sliver of the rat brain that is devoted to the movement of, of whiskers. It hasn't produced any particular insights, but above all, this is just neurons. It doesn't involve all the other cells we have in our brains, and it is completely disconnected from the body, which is kind of odd because this is actually for, you know, the, the rat being able to say, well, you know, I've, I've twitched something here. So integrating the body and the brain, I think, is absolutely essential. And the kind of things people are often very excited about, understandably so, are things like the, 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 the brain-gut axis. Now, we know about the neural connections between the two, but it's recently been discovered uh, that the microbiota, the things you have, the bugs you have living in your stomach and your intestines, which your, your, the microbes that help you digest, are also involved in providing some of the uh, precursors for the synthesis of various uh, neurotransmitters. Now, there's no simple one-to-one -one connection. It's not a way of saying, eat beetroot and you'll keep your bugs happy and you won't get depressed. I'm not saying that. You should, probably should eat beetroot. It's not going to do you any harm. Uh, but there is the, you know, our brains are in our bodies and they are bobbing about in there. And our perception of experience is not of that of a little, you know, homunculus peering out through our eyes. Our per perception is of our bodies. I and mean, I could tell you, you know, I'm, I am feeling now uh, not very different. My emotions, even my ability to think are different now because I am, it's very warm in the attic. I'm quite agitated because I'm speaking to uh, a number of people online. And so clearly that, and that's to do with my body. It's not simply to do with my brain. So those things are completely in, interconnected and there may in the future be ways of understanding it more directly through this uh, brain gut axis. Okay, um, next question, um, if you could be really, really Catherine Hewlett, we're going to ask your question next. So your microphone should be open any moment. We will be finishing soon. Hi there. Can... Hi Catherine. Hi, uh, thank you. I really enjoyed your talks. Um, you. I, now, I'm very interested to know why some people have the ability to think visually and memorise things almost three-dimensionally in their brains and why some people can't do it at all. Yeah, um, well, again, I, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to bat that one into the, my guess, m decades, centuries into the future. Um, I don't think we really know that. I can give you, I'll give you a hand wavy, you know, make it made up answer, but the real answer is we don't know. And uh, there are clearly differences between us all. I mean, we're, you know, we're all unique, all those, 80 billion neurons are not wired in the same way. I mean, even the maggot brain, those 10,000 neurons of the maggot brain, the, the, the wiring diagram they're making of the maggot brain is of a maggot. We know that different maggots have their brains wired up in slightly different ways. And clearly my brain's wired up from, differently from yours. Uh, some of that is to do with my experience. Some of that is to do with our respective ages. Some of that is to do with uh, the fact that you're a woman and I'm a man and that will have I don't know, very subtle, but nonetheless significant differences. And my guess would be that early life had, has an important aspect to how we're able to, to think. We know that, for example, with music. If you, if you learn music and uh, languages when you're young, then that retains a certain level of mental flexibility that enables you to learn other languages much easier and you're probably okay at maths as well and there's a kind of network of similar processes similar skills that if you get them when they're young you can then carry on applying them and that's one reason why adults find it incredibly difficult to learn a foreign language if they're mono monolingual i mean they had no problem learning their home mother tongue when they were babies <laughs> But when you try and learn it when you're old, it's really hard. And that's because the certain pathways are now kind of set. Um, 
And my guess is, but I don't know, and I don't, I'm sure nobody knows, there's going to be something similar in terms of the way we, we think and, as you say, the, the way that some people can conceive things and imagine them uh, conceptually. I mean, sometimes this does take um, odd kind of roots. So you have people who've got, who have synesthesia who will see uh, sounds or hear colours uh, which is very difficult to imagine what it's like if you don't experience it. But having talked to a number of people who have this, it's it, it's absolutely clear that their 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 senses are kind of mixed up. And uh, any of you who've engaged in certain psychedelic drugs may have had a similar experience. That might give you some insight, might give us some insight into the biochemical processes, or it may not. It may just be the same effect is produced by two very different causes. So I'm afraid I really don't know. But remember, those are the four most important words in science we don't know, because that enables us to imagine, well, what would we have to do to find out? What do we need to know? And I think you know, knowing stuff for scientists is great and very interesting, but you know, everybody's got the whole of human knowledge in their pocket now through a phone. The really interesting thing about science is what we don't know and then working out how we could find out. Um, I'm not sure how I could do an experiment, mind you. <laughs> To thank you very person. much. That was really good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I think what we're learning is the brain is a complicated thing. and We've still got much to learn with our brains. Um, I'm going to open the mic, mic, microphone. The final uh, question of the afternoon. Katie Matthews, if you're willing to talk. Um, I think we're end on a slightly more philosophical note. If you are there, Katie. Maybe. Katie, are you wearing your tiara? I don't know what you mean. Okay, let's... <laughs> yes, can you, can you, the picture's got a tiara. Hello, oh, can, you, can you hear me now? Sorry, can I, I hear you I'm now? Using, yeah, so I'm using Katie's machine. Okay, you're not wearing the okay. tiara. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm not. <laughs> Disappointing. Hey, um, thank you, Mr. Cobb. I really enjoyed your talk today. I, I just wanted to ask, uh, just for your opinion, really, or your view on, on what I keep reading about is the hard problem um, of philosophy, the notion that we have these unique experiences, um, you know, the, the, the capacity to experience the subjective rightness of, of a certain thing or the, these um, experiences that are ours and we know they're ours. Do, do, do you regard that as a, a, a problem for, um, I don't know, for neurobiology or not? Well... Um, there's a bit of philosophy bashing in my book. Um, and one of the things that, so it, it, it's primary, what's interesting is that this is something that people have worried about for millennia and the philosophers have had it entirely to themselves as they should do, uh, until very recently when scientists started getting interested in it. Um, my own view is that it is not at the moment a doable scientific problem. That is, I don't think we've got the tools for exploring this from a scientific point of view. And I'm a scientist, not a philosopher. I make less than zero claims to uh, philosophical competence because philosophy is really, really hard. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of training to do it properly. Um, but the insight they've given us, I think, especially in the last kind of 30 years over what are called qualia, or quail, yeah, quailies, quales, I don't know how to pronounce it. So yeah. this is the, the, the sensation of redness that you have. Now, some philosophers say, well, look, this is just a, you know, this is just what emerges out of a load of neuro, uh, a load of um, uh, the activity of a, 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 set of, a set of neurons. And so the philosophers don't agree with each other, which I think indicates there's a problem. And they don't even agree, they don't even have schools of philosophy. Mm. You know, I mean, scientists at least tend to agree in, agree in groups about certain things, whereas philosophers all disagree with each other. So that suggests to me that maybe nobody has actually really nailed it, no matter how confident they might uh, be in arguing it. Um, so my view is that un understanding consciousness and in particular, uh, how it, this, this hard problem, how the, the sensation of being there, as you said, the, the redness of a berry is always the thing that people talk about. I don't think we're going to understand how that works for centuries. You know, my, my guesstimate, which is worth nothing, uh, of how long it's going to take us to fully understand the maggot brain 
with its 10,000 neurons is about 50 years. That's what I would guess that you know, new computation and greater understanding of how the, wire, the wiring diagram, the maggot brain and all the rest of it, and in the end, we'll be able to fully model it. And maybe the mind of a maggot and its qualia, its sensations of being in yeast and the very limited world it lives in, that will emerge out of that computer model. Um, I'm not sure how we know about that. Uh, but one of the things we'd have to do would be to integrate that with the body of the maggot as well, because the maggot's brain is in its body too. For humans, um, I mean, you can see the scale of the problem. One of the things I've tried to emphasize in the talk and in my book is, uh, I mean, I haven't talked much about the fantastic work that is being doing, because there is extraordinary work that is being done by neuroscientists on complicated brains and complicated nervous systems. So I don't want to, I'm not out to trash it all by any means, but it's the gap between what real understanding would represent and where we are at the moment. That's what I'm trying to get over. So um, at the moment, there's two main theories of consciousness, uh, which are highly mathematical. Um, I don't understand either of them. I'm quite happy to say that I can't judge the maths. What I do know is they're not connected to elect electrical activity in neurons, which is what ultimately it's got to come down to. And what I think the people who coming up, these are neuroscientists, sometimes they've got philosophical pals, but they're general neuroscientists. My view is that that needs to be applied to very, that intelligence, that, that mathematical insight needs to be applied to very simple problems, either very simple uh, nervous systems like the maggot brain or even you know, the, the, the lobster's stomach. Let's uh, see whether those models can explain what's going on there or to a simpler aspect of uh, consciousness, like say attention. And this was what Francis Crick, who's in fact responsible for most of this scientific interest in the question, he turned to, when he retired, he decided to crack neuroscience. Uh, and he didn't, but he did do a remarkable job. And he focused people's on attention on the need to understand neural networks and, all, and therefore neuroanatomy, but also on the need to focus on a, on a soluble part of the problem. What he argued is we should be looking for the neural correlates of consciousness and in fact the neural correlates of attention to the organism paying attention to a particular stimulus. That, that must change patterns of activity in the brain in a consistent way. Well, what is it? Where are the neurons that are doing that? How can we alter their activity and alter consciousness of perception and so on? Um, and for the moment, I think we've kind of got a bit lost and the, 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 the big theories are kind of drifted away to trying to explain everything. And the, the, the basic information just isn't there, I don't think, in terms of the activity of the cells that are involved in that and their interconnections. And yeah, lobster's stomach is always what I throw out at this point to say we really have no idea. So um, I think including brains are a complete Thank you. Brains are a complicated business. Um, Professor Matthew Cobb, thank you very much for a brilliant talk. Thank you very uh, much, everybody. Enjoyed it, and it didn't. It, in a way, it wasn't illuminating because there's so much more to learn. But that in itself was illuminating. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Sorry, we didn't get to everyone. Um, we will be convening again in a couple of weeks' time to talk about uh, universal income, if I remember correctly. Um, so I want to say thank you very much everyone for participating, Professor Cobb, and we will see you again soon at Conway Hall in Quarry. Stay safe everybody. Thank you, absolutely. Bye. Bye.